Um, welcome this afternoon. I'm Abby Wolf, the Executive Director of the Hutchins Center, and it is a pleasure to welcome you back to this virtual space that we have become so familiar with for this semester's first W.E.B. Du Bois virtual lecture series presented by the brilliant writer Daryl Pinckney, whom I've just had the pleasure of meeting for a few minutes, and I'm so looking forward to all that he has to say. Um, one brief housekeeping item. Please write your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. We ask that you keep them brief so that we can incorporate as many as possible. And questions may be edited for clarity and length during the Q&A. Um, now, for a moment, it's my pleasure to say a few words about Jesse McCarthy, who will introduce Daryl Pinckney's lecture this afternoon. Jesse, McCar Jesse McCarthy is an assistant professor in the departments of English and African and African American Studies at Harvard. He is currently completing a book project, The Blue Period, Black, pa Black Writing in the Early Cold War, 1945 to 1965, a study of the relationship between aesthetic strategy and political commitment in Black literature in the decades between the end of World War II and the rise of the Black Power Movement. He's a contributor to forthcoming edited volumes on Ralph Ellison and Richard Wright for Cambridge University Press, and an introduction for the new Dalkey Archive Press edition of Vincent O. Carter's The Burn Book. Oh. He will also write the introduction and annotations for a new edition of Du Bois's The Souls of Black Folk for the Norton Library. His essays and reviews on race, literature, politics, and music have appeared in The Nation, Descent, and The Point, where he is also a contributing editor. His first book, a collection of essays entitled Who Will Pay Reparations on My Soul will be published by Norton in spring, in this coming spring. And some of you may have had the good fortune to hear him deliver a colloquium for us um, recent, within the last couple of weeks um, reading from that, that fabulous book. Um, please join me in welcoming Jesse McCarthy, a good friend of the Hutchins Centers, to the W.E.B. Du Bois virtual lecture series this afternoon. Thank you and enjoy. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Abby, and thank you as always to all the members and all the staff members behind the scenes at the Hutchins Center um, who make this wonderful series possible. Um, I want to begin by saying that it is uh, customary in my position to list off the accolades and titles of the curriculum vitae of an invited guest. And our guest lecturer today has received many. But I would rather begin today on a more personal note because his long and distinguished career will ultimately be measured, I think, in the way that literary achievement has to be measured, which is ultimately uh, in the regard and value that writers, thinkers, and scholars confer upon each other as part of a living and signifying tradition that extends through time and long outlives and outshines the significance of awards and titles as, as lovely as those may be. I can remember distinctly the first time I read Daryl Pinckney. It was in the very early 2000s and uh, I was a somewhat awkward college student, an English major, interested in writing, and grappling with a lot of fairly typical questions about how to do that, how to write, what to write, what to read, and how, and why. The library periodical room carried the usual array of impressive literary magazines, and the New York Review of Books featured prominently among them. In their pages, I discovered a writer reviewing a then pioneering scholar, Elizabeth McHenry, whose book, Forgotten Readers, a study of African-American literary societies and reading groups is now a classic. The review was by Daryl Pinckney. And I remember distinctly thinking that I had stumbled across a brilliant new voice, a sort of living James Baldwin, one who had picked up the mantle, so to speak, and wielded this extraordinary prose, as graceful, supple, and lucid as any you could find, and who seemed to understand and care for the history and traditions of Black expressive cultures 
in a way that I thought existed only in a bygone and by then already anthologized era. Of course, I quickly discovered that this writer who practiced the art of criticism was no newcomer. Pinckney has been writing in various places and in many modes, but with an especially close identification with the New York Review of Books since 1977. And his essays, including many of his most important recent work, are gathered in his collection, Busted in New York, and other essays from 2019. I think it's safe to say that it's, it's no exaggeration, uh, at least in my case, that almost everything I learned about how to be a critic, I learned from reading and really in a sense studying Pinckney's writings. And there's no question that I wouldn't be in the position that I am today without his example, for which I will always be grateful. In 2016, I had the occasion to meet him only very briefly, uh, somewhat sort of in a fan mode, after a reading he gave at the Weeksville Heritage Center in Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn, where he was in conversation with Vincent Cunningham, who was himself just then emerging as a great essayist in his own right and who works at the New Yorker. And I would say another voice um, that in ways small and large is marked by the example, and if I may say the precedent that Pinckney set for us. I would be remiss too if I didn't take this opportunity to publicly say a word about Pinckney's fiction, work that I think is sometimes somewhat overshadowed by his brilliance in the essay form. He's most recently the author of the novel Black Deutschland from 2016, but I'm particularly keen to shine a light on his first novel, High Cotton from 1992, which I consider a modern classic and one that is too often overlooked, though I am pleased to be part of a new generation of writers and scholars who are rediscovering it. And I hope not only canonizing it, but learning from it by example about how to think and write about some of the confusions of class, race, and the complications and convolutions of blackness as it exists within the context of a cosmopolitan and postmodern culture. As our very own Henry Louis Gates Jr. has said, and I quote, Daryl Pinckney has taught me more about African American literature than any other professor or critic in our field. His insights and close readings of the tradition are subtle, nuanced, and stunningly original. I think of him as one of our greatest mentors. End quote. I think those words, spoken from one whose contributions and encyclopedic authority are legendary in our own time, speaks volumes. Zadie Smith, in a profile dedicated to him, has said, quote, How lucky we are to have Daryl Pinckney, who, without rancor, without insult, has all these years been taking down our various songs, examining them with love and care, and bringing them back from the past." End quote. It is well said. How lucky we are for his example. How lucky we are indeed for the enduring and ongoing project he has been undertaking and continues to advance in these difficult days. And I think I can speak on behalf of the faculty, the staff, the fellows, and all the members of the Hutchins Center in saying how lucky we are and how pleased we are to welcome you, Daryl, and to have you with us here today. Thank you. Bravo, bravo, Jesse. Welcome, Daryl. Welcome, my brother. It's nice to have you back giving uh, the Du Bois lectures. And I am um, just, I can't wait to hear you. <laughs> After all, that's going to take me a minute to get started. <clears throat> it's very funny because uh, Zadie Smith said, I have a Christmas present for you. And she presented it in a kind of electronic Zamitstadt. And she said, this is amazing. And it was, who will pay reparations for my soul by this guy, Jesse McCarthy. She wasn't kidding. So I was going to say that, um, Thank you, uh, Jesse, for that. I 
I'm kind of thrown. Uh, sometimes you don't know who you're writing for. And so it's always mattered to me to be in conversation with Henry Louis Gates Jr. Sorry. I was going to say that um, I overlooked Frederick Douglass's address, um, Pictures in Progress, until I read an essay by Professor Gates on Douglass's grasp of the importance of photography. And I was going to say that I thank him for that and so much else, including the invitation to give this talk. But over the last two evenings, I've been watching his documentary, The Black Church. And I have to congratulate him and his collaborators on this extraordinary achievement. It is um, unutterably beautiful. And I was more moved by it than any sermon I've ever heard in church. And I ask, we'll be shaken up for some time to come, uh, thinking about um, uh, the Black church uh, as this uh, filter or engine of history that I'd never sort of considered before. I, uh, uh, and so it is a real gift, everything about it. Uh, it's one of these things that's sort of not to the side, not talking about, but in the middle of the thing it's presenting. Uh, it's uh, put together in the most amazing way and so incredibly written. Um, I'm stumbling, uh, but it'll take a while to take in that documentary and uh, I think I will have to watch it uh, again. Uh, anyway, it's nice where you can be yourself, even if you're confused. Between the going out of the old order and the coming in of a new one, we are in Gramsci's interregnum of morbid symptoms. Some people in Charleston, South Carolina, didn't want to honor Denmark Vesey, the accused leader of a planned Black uprising in 1822, because he was a terrorist, they said. Nevertheless, a large bronze statue on a granite pedestal was dedicated to Vesey's memory in 2014. A free black man, Vesey was among the founders of the Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston in 1817. A white mob burned it down after Vesey's execution. It was rebuilt twice after the Civil War. In 2015, a white supremacist massacred the church's black pastor and eight black parishioners while they were having a Bible class. New Orleans Mayor Mitch Laundrieu began the review of his city's public monuments in 2015. In the spring of 2017, the imposing statue of Robert E. Lee by Alexander Doyle was taken from its 80-foot pedestal to an undisclosed location. The statues of others celebrating what Landrieu called the cult of the lost cause followed. In a city of people descended from many nations, a city that was the country's largest slave market, the statues were not just stone and metal, Landrieu said. A white politician who would write a book about his decision to remove the monuments, Landrieu asked why there were no slave ship monuments, no remembrances on public land of the slave block or lynchings. He was emphatic that he held to a careful process of public hearing, city council votes, and review by 13 federal and state judges. The monuments in accordance with the law have been removed. But in August of 2017, three people died in Charlottesville, Virginia during planned protests that started with demonstrations against the removal of a large bronze monument of Lee astride his favorite horse. The city council had voted to take the equestrian monument out of Lee Park, renamed Emancipation Park, but a judge granted a temporary injunction after a coalition of historians and Confederate supporters filed an appeal. Torchlight carrying Klan members faced off with University of Virginia students at the base of a statue of Thomas Jefferson. Neo-Nazis chanted Jews were not a racist in blood and soil. Paying for the past, correcting the past, eradicating the past, governing the future. Comparison to Germany came up during the disturbances in Charlottesville when people were shocked to find that monuments to Confederate generals spoke to white supremacists. Germany's talk with itself had had to wait until the 1970s when a younger generation asked questions of its parents. 
in the villages and towns of Germany, there are memorials to the soldiers, the vanquished of World War I and World War II, as if to say people have a right to mourn their dead. The eternal flame in the tomb of the unknown soldier in the classicist Schinko Pavilion in Berlin during the life of the German Democratic Republic was beautiful. The Museum of Unconditional Surrender maintained in a Berlin suburb for the education of homesick Soviet troops is now the Russian and German Museum. Germany after reunification kept the Soviet war memorial in the tear garden minus tanks. It was erected in 1945 with stone from the Reich's chancellery. It lies across the path of the Kaiser's victory alley, Wilhelm II's 1903 avenue of three dozen terracotta figures celebrating Royal Prussia. After the fall of the Nazis, a curator rescued and buried them. They were discovered again in the 1970s and moved behind a wall in distant Spandau Citadel. The late 19th century Bismarck Memorial with its symbols of German imperial glory is still in the spot in the Tiergarten where it was moved in 1938 in preparation for grand designs that were never realized. Albert Speer showed his father the architectural model for a new Berlin, Germania, and his father said, you've all gone completely crazy. German courts have always dealt harshly with cases involving public displays of Nazi symbols. Some people regard the stadiums in Nuremberg and Berlin as Nazi symbols. When Liebes Kent's Jewish Memorial opened and the Jewish Memorial and the Pink Triangle Memorial were completed, people say, said they were possible because the generation that would have objected to them had gone at last. The clash last summer between police and demonstrators in Richmond, Virginia following George Floyd's killing turned to a battle, not just over the past, but seemingly with the past. Demonstrators set fire to the memorial for the women of the Confederacy, a Mussolini era mausoleum looking building set in a public park maintained by the state. In 1996, the autobiographical memo memorial by Paul de Pasquale to black tennis champion and native son, Arthur Ashe, was added to Monument Avenue in Richmond, though vehemently opposed by the head of the state's historic preservation association who argued that the boulevard for what, what was, was for what he called Southern symbols. Then the Democratic Party won control of the Virginia State Legislature and passed a bill giving cities the power to remove, relocate, contextualize, cover, or alter monuments, providing they went through a formal process. Last summer, the new law allowed Richmond's first black mayor, LeVar Stoney, to call in the machines. Impatient demonstrators had already toppled the statue of another Confederate general from the plinth where he'd been in a city park since 1891. And when Jefferson Davis's statue went down, there were shouts of victory. The iconoclasm continued in the unrest. The memorial to Arthur Ashe was spray painted with WLM. Stonewall Jackson and two others on Monument Avenue were taken away. The Soldiers and Sailors Monument on nearby Libby Hill was also removed. Most of the statues were the work of George Julian Zolnay a Hungarian-born sculptor popular in civic circles in the early 20th century South. He was a founder of the National Arts Club and a director of the Arts Institute of Chicago. Stoney announced plans for a museum commemorating Shaco Bottom, Richmond's slave trading quarters. All this time, looking back over his right shoulder, Kehinda Wiley's monumental equestrian steely bronze of an African-American man dressed in contemporary street clothes his head featuring buzz cut sides and a crown of tied up dreadlocks kept visual for the future on Arthur Ashe Boulevard in front of the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. It was unveiled to great fanfare in 2019 after having made something of a sensation when on display in Times Square beforehand. This is consequential, Wiley said in Richmond at the time of his 27 foot sculptures installation on a scale that goes beyond museum walls. Wiley's work deals in appropriation of neoclassicism taking over the heroic, projecting into the big frame images of the hip hop generation's boldness. Last June, Princeton's president, Christopher L. Eisgruber said that in retiring Woodrow Wilson's name from a residential college and public policy school, it wasn't that Wilson like Lee had been honored because he defended slavery. Wilson had made Princeton a great research institution. Nevertheless, Wilson was an inappropriate namesake, Eisgruber concluded, and Princeton couldn't go on being an institution that disregarded or ignored racism. Theodore Roosevelt broke his promises to the black veterans of San Juan Hill, but he was not Woodrow Wilson. New York City's mayoral commission to review monuments couldn't decide about the large equestrian bronze of Roosevelt and the entrance to the American Natural History Museum. 
The problem is less Roosevelt's politics than the object itself. As Marcus Aurelius, Roosevelt has always looked faintly ridiculous, high up, padded, and flanked by two figures on foot, one black, the other Native American. The black man is muscular, serious of mien, and scantily clad, therefore a primitive. The Native American is equally handsome and wears headdress and blanket. The statue by James Earl Fraser was installed in 1940, rather late sounding for the anthropological assumptions on display in it. <clears throat> Oh, sorry. Uh, Fraser, originally from Minnesota, had experience of Native American culture growing up, and he modeled the three-quarter profile in what was once known as the Indian head or buffalo nickel. Fraser's most famous work, Into the Trail, shows the earnest piety toward the Native American in the late 19th and early 20th century American culture of his youth. Once Native Americans had been nearly wiped out, their bravery as warriors was honored, especially in comparison to Black people who, it was claimed at the time, did not rebel against slavery. The museum's president, Ellen V. Futter, said in a statement that many among the museum staff found the figures and their placement racist. Fraser's noble intentions don't alter the message of complicity and the American expansionist project that he unwittingly sealed up in his non-white figures. But it was not for the first time I wondered whether institutional politics were operating under the cover of standing up for principles. It's my turn. A contentious exhibition concerning the statue and its meanings for different people told us how subjective our judgments about the informational importance of most public art. One man said that his favorite thing about visiting the Natural History Museum as a schoolboy was leaving because the balls of Roosevelt's horse were the first thing he saw exiting through the doors and they were hilariously large to him. The neighborhood is attached to the ensemble and finds it integral to the architect John Russell Pope's design for the entrance, a triumphal arch in the Beaux-Arts style over the sweep of steps. The arch was commissioned in New York State's memorial as the New York State's memorial to Roosevelt, the former governor as well as the former president. And the museum itself sits in Theodore Roosevelt Park. In 2017, the Order of Sons of Italy and America, located in Massapequa, New York, offered to take any unwanted civic Christopher Columbus statues. The statue to Columbus by Geronimo Genoa in Central Park, commissioned for the 40th, 400th anniversary of his voyage, had been spray painted. The following year, the Mayoral Advisory Commission on City Art, Monument, and Mass recommended that the city keep the Columbus Monument at 59th Street, a marble statue on a granite pedestal standing 76 feet at the entrance of Central Park. The New York State Board of Historic Preservation placed it on its register. The drive behind the monument, cast in Italy, designed by Gaetano Russo in 1892, had come from a prominent Italian-American businessman. In the 19th century, despised Italian immigrants embraced Columbus as a figure of pride, an Italian forebearer who represented their stake in American society. Last summer, Christopher Columbus's statue in Richmond, Virginia was dragged into a lake. Members of American Indian movement put ropes around a statue of Columbus in front of the state capitol building in St. Paul, Minnesota and pulled it down. A late 20th century st statue of Columbus in Boston was beheaded, not for the first time, while others were attacked in Miami and Little Italy and the Bronx. An organization called change.org circulated petitions against local Columbus statues in Columbus Square, Queens and Columbus Park, Brooklyn. St. Louis removed a statue of Columbus from the park in order to keep it pleasant for visitors, authorities explained. A marble statue of Columbus as a young man was brought from Italy in 1849 and given to the city of Boston where it hides out, so to speak, in Lewisburg Square. In the Harlem Renaissance, Columbus's voyage was considered an achievement and some black scholars wanted to be able to say black people had been a part of it even as enslaved labor. At one time, Columbus's voyage seemed headed toward revitalization as a story of inclusiveness. Spaniards, Basque, Portuguese, Catholic Italians, Jews from Venice, and a Spaniard of African descent, the pilot of Santa Maria. Eventually, Pietro Alonso Nino and Columbus fell out as Columbus did with all his associates. For years now, Columbus has not been the explorer, rather the founder robber, the bringer of disease and slavery. Not only were people already here discovered to themselves, he brought his voice as priests and fantasies of having got to China. Yet my urban nostalgia disqualifies me from sober thought because I associate Columbus Circle with the city life I've seen there, rather like Trafalgar Square over the years. My eyes are at street level in this past that I am not distanced from. I see as impossible to edit of its everyday accumulations. Every generation assumes it is closer than its predecessor to separating falsehood from truth. 
when it comes to black history or any history, we want interpretive closure and cannot have it because there is always something more to find out. Away with Zoni, Lee was a traitor to the union. Lee fought to hold a people in captivity. But what if I don't agree that that Boston statue of Lincoln and a free man denigrates the kneeling black man who is not looking up at the great emancipator but gazing off into his own future? The University of Kentucky decided to concede to student demands and remove a large mural made by Anne Rice O'Hanlon in 1934. Illustrating Kentucky history, it shows in a central place for enslaved people with tobacco plants, a segregated audience watching a passenger steam train, and Black people playing the instruments and dancing. There is also a Native American with a tomahawk and the detailed composition as if ready to attack. In 2018, Karen Olivier, a Black artist, completed the work Witness meant to answer O'Hanlon's. Olivier painted Black and Native American people on gold leaf in the dome of the building that houses the mural. She has said that if the university proceeds with its plan to move O'Hanlon's mural, then she would ask that her work also be taken down because to censor O'Hanlon would be to subject her to censorship as well. Her work needed O'Hanlon's for its full meaning, she said. In 2019, the San Francisco Board of Education voted to paint over a 1600 square meter mural at George Washington High School after students and parents complained that the work showed black people enslaved painted by Viktor Arnotov in 1936, a Russian immigrant and communist who had been an assistant to Diego Rivera. It is the largest mural com commissioned by the Works Project Administration. Roosevelt's admiration for Rivera strengthened his support of the WPA, the Living New Deal, a volunteer organization that keeps an inventory of 16,000 public works from the New Deal era, has gone out of its way to explain Arnotov's mural, the life of George Washington, and how radical his intentions were at the time and pointing out unequivocally that Washington had slaves. The possible tragedy of loss shows the necessity of proceeding in matters of our artistic heritage case by case. Found in schools, hospitals, libraries, post offices, and historically black colleges across the United States, WPA government commissions supported artists during the depression. The murals are not only public works, they are also a people's art and a distinct idiom of the period, the subjects, and especially in their style. The Public Works of Art Project commissioned Earl Richardson's painting of barefoot black workers in a cotton field in 1934. It hung in the Department of Transportation is now in the Smithsonian. Richardson planned murals with his partner, Malvin Gray Johnson, also an artist, but Richardson committed suicide in 1935 after Johnson's untimely death. The depictions of black laborers in their work show Rivera's influence, his fusion of Cubist and Mexican shapes. But what if Richardson had been white? An aesthetic heritage that is at risk in what seems suspiciously like copycat activism. Error grows fast as in hot brains, both the Inquisition and the Lutherans decreed. Nelson Rockefeller put a halt to a Rivera mural at Rockefeller Center that he objected to. Black students at George Washington High School have claimed that they are not destroying art so much as creating the space they need in order to heal. Maybe the best way to heal is by learning something new. The Legacy Museum at Tuskegee College in Tuskegee, Alabama is training curators as it takes care of and mends the 20 surviving dioramas about, about Black life that it has from the Negro World Exposition held in Chicago in 1940. To mark the bicentenary of the abolition of the slave trade in 2007, Britain's National Trust, synonymous with tradition-bound stewardship, organized exhibitions in some of its properties associated with the cruelties of slavery, such as Penryn Castle in North Wales, its opulence a sign of the fortune that his ardently pro-slavery owner Richard Pennant amassed from his sugar plantations in Jamaica in the 18th century. Candor cannot bestow acceptability, but to say who Pennant was, what he did, saves Joshua Reynolds' portrait of Pennant as part of the collection. The cabinet on display at Charlcote Park is given a story that extends from its exquisite inlay back to its original owner, William Beckford. He is remembered as an outrageous figure in queer history, but the craziness of his life, his eccentricity as a builder and brilliance as a collector were paid for by the money his family made in Jamaican sugar. His name is disappearing from public places around England. The bill comes due. If context can change meaning, can absolve artifacts of the crimes of their original cultures, then the personal can still persuade, convict, it is in full bloom the idea that a monument or object can do a person or people's harm by its existence, by its placement that gives to the individuals or cause or history 
represented by them a valor or public significance they should no longer have and never deserved? Who decides? I do not have to be a commission, a city council, a legislature, governor, mayor, board. I am the community or I am myself. The large florid bewigged statue of 17th century Bristol merchant and philanthropist Edward Colston had been under attack since the 1990s because Colston was prominent in the Royal African Company, which had a monopoly on the English slave trade for many years. Erected in 1895 by the Royal Academician John Cassidy, the bronze was toppled by demonstrators last June and dumped into a nearby canal. Bristol's mayor had little respect for the work, he said. Nevertheless, he had the grade two listed piece salvaged and stored for some future exhibition in one of the city's museums. A month after Colson was pulled down, the artist Mark Quinn led a small group under the cover of night to install on in the plinth where Colston had stood Quinn's dark resin and steel statue of Jen Reed, a young black woman, a Black Lives Matter protester. Reed is posed in skirt and leather jacket and cap, her right arm raised in the black power salute. She'd been photographed in this pose during the protest in front of Colston's statue. A lot of black person's hair frames her young face. The Bristol Council took it down the next day, saying that Quinn had not gone through the proper channels. In an interview with The Guardian, Jen Reed spoke not only of being offended by a memorial to Colston, Colston in the center of town, a figure who was not a, to black people a hero. Reed said that to walk by the statue when she was growing up had hurt. Between 1698 and 1807, Bristol transported half a million slaves. The statue of Jean Reed should go back up. Palmerston was gone from Parliament Square, but it was striding Jan Smuts, whose name sounded out of place. He was Afrikaner, though he lost the election in 1948 to the Nationalists because he said apartheid would not work. Churchill lobbied, lobbied to have Smuts added to Parliament Square. The Smuts, the, Smut, the Smuts statue, put in place in 1951, was made by Jacob Epstein, who also did Oscar Wilde's tomb. Thousands chanted in Parliament Square last summer, adding to the name Churchill in black paint was a racist. It was boarded up in anticipation of further protests, but in this moment of distracting pandemic lockdown, the figure of a wartime Churchill stands bravely exposed. Statues of Cecil Rhodes had already gone down at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa, and students of Rhodes Must Fall at Oxford University won their long struggle to have his figure removed from the niche in the street facade of Oriel College. The Roads Must Fall campaign announced plans some time ago to target the marble statue of Christopher Codrington, a 17th century sugar magnet dressed as an emperor in the middle of the library at All Souls College. Endowed by Codrington, designed by Nicholas Hawksmoor, built between 1724 and 1761, the grade one library is one of the most beautiful in England. Spokespeople for Roads Must Fall said that it was not the presence of the statue as much as the absence within the library itself of any mention of its history, how it came to be, or any description of the Barbados that Codrington came from. Three years ago, Alawafina Nylander, a member of Rhodes Must Fall, stood outside the library shirtless with a chain around his neck and all slaves library painted in red across his chest. The Guardian recently published a list of 39 statues that have been taken down and 30 squares and streets renamed across the UK. Many long on the list of a group target called topplethereaces.org. Monuments to imperialists and colonialists need to be removed so that Britain can finally face the truth about its past, its site said. The marble statue of Sir Thomas Picton, a brutal governor of Trinidad, found no protection from Dan Dath, the first black lord mayor of Cardiff. In 1580, Francis Drake circumnavigated the globe, but in 1567, he had led one of the first English expeditions to capture Africans. A group called Save Our Statues managed to keep his statue in Plymouth. The problem is that most every monument in the UK could potentially offend someone. Mary Tudor burned heretics, but forbade English participation in the slave trade. A lot of crumbling has already taken place. A sculpture park near Delhi is a cemetery for symbols of the Raj. The UK is a sculpture park because white supremacists are not rallying around Queen Victoria's monument in front of Buckingham Palace at the monument to Victoria in the center of Calcutta. Britishness and empire have been satirical subjects in British popular culture since the 1960s. If we are to insist that imperialism is still alive or that sun never sets on its meanings or merely dormant or must be reckoned with by erasure, then some might ask if imperialist symbols in the Edwardian Admiralty Arch could not be spared on other grounds. 
on Juneteenth, the statue of a welcoming Nelson Mandela by Ian Walters that had been in Parliament Square since 2001 was boarded up temporarily because of threats from right-wing groups. A bust of Mandela by Walters went unnoticed outside the South Bank Center, unveiled in 1985 when he was still in prison freedom fighter. Statues to Mandela have proliferated since his death in 2013. We are told that in Africa, he's depicted mostly with his fist raised in salute. The change in narrative was like a change of government when the Metropolitan Museum celebrated the reopening of its British galleries for decorative arts and design in the last party days of 2020. Over 700 objects made in Britain spanning the centuries from 1500 to 1900 are held by the museum. What do tea and sugar have to do with colonial expansion? The audio guide now asks. The revised historiography has the effect of democratizing the objects, emphasizing the histories of the materials, the technical achievements, and the working women involved in their production. The wall texts that accompany the galleries of three spectacular 18th century interiors, the dining room from Lansdowne House and the tapestry room from Croom Court, both designed by Robert Adam, and the Rococo dining room from Kirtlington Park by William Smith and John Sanderson, call to mind the scene in Jane Austen's Mansfield Park when Fanny tries to introduce the subject of the Caribbean plantations, the swank people up from London fall silent, look at her, and then go on gossiping. The charm of 18th century architecture in London was made possible by the slave trade and slave labor. The Georgian was considered English, which was why Dublin in the militant 1970s started to tear down buildings in the Georgian style. Then they stopped before it was all gone. Demoting whiteness, the resistance to monument removal says that to recontextualize whiteness is to some people a loss of status. We put aside hesitations about the actual complexity of identity and don't ask why it is white supremacy is the only kind of heritage whiteness can be associated with. It's not all colonialism, Mark Morris said, of the influence of the Indian choreography, choreographer Vijay Jani set Pathy on his work. It's as if our aim is to make all identities subject to the same jurisdiction to insist that they are alike, that they have equal value so that one identity doesn't get to assume or act like it's the standard or the norm or the definition of normal. To say that statues have the power to wound, to hurt, when we mean they can offend and outrage has to do with our nervous respect for the moral authority of the victim. To say it is my experience, my truth is also to say that I cannot be interro interrogated. I can't doubt someone else's reactions to these things just because I don't share them. Last summer, the New York Times reported that on Juneteenth, the museum's powerful chairman of European paintings, Keith Christensen, who had worked at the Met since 1977, posted an Instagram showing a reproduction of a pen and ink drawing of the archeologist, Alexander Lenoir, who the newspaper went on to say, devoted himself to saving France's historic monuments from the ravages of the French Revolution. Christensen's Instagram post, Alexander Lenoir, battling the revolutionary zealots bent on destroying the royal tombs in Saint-Denis. How many great works of art have been lost to rid ourselves of a past of which we do not approve? Christensen added that we are grateful to Lenoir because he realized that the artistic and historical value of the tombs extended beyond a defining moment of social and political upheaval and change. The Times story said that Art Museum Transparency, an advocacy, advocacy group of art workers, posted a message on Twitter to the Met that one of its most powerful curators suggested that it's a shame we're trying to rid ourselves of a past of which we don't approve by removing monuments, and worse, making a dog whistle of an equation of BLM activists with revolutionary zealots. Christensen took down the post and issued an apology to the Met staff, saying that he would offer no excuses. Monuments to those who promoted racist ideologies and systems should never be glorified or placed in a location where they could cause further harm, he said. However, 15 ERG co-conveners identified as the museum's employee resources group, signed a letter expressing their anger that Christensen's post seemed to equate Black Lives Matter protesters with revolutionary zealots. His position of power within our Met and the decision-making he affects as a department head and senior curator with regard to programming, staff hiring, and institutional direction are more to our point. So if the Phrygian cap fits, wear it. Keith Christensen was doing his job. He is a curator. He's supposed to think about these things. But if I am accused, my higher ups must abandon me. I will denounce myself. I cannot save a distinguished career. Christensen's Caravaggio exhibition at the Met in 1985 was for many the first real introduction to that artist. Great painting collections are not uh, censoring 
images of the Black on their walls as a current exhibition, Black Presence at the Rice Museum shows. The Abbey Church of Saint-Denis, finished in 1140, was constructed in the remains of a Roman cemetery. The ancestry of every subsequent Gothic church in the world can be traced back to it, Your Honor said in the history of art. Whether the builders realized the import of what they had done is doubtful, he continued. Suger, the abbot of Saint-Denis, recorded that both our own people and the pious neighbors, nobles and common folk alike, would tie their arms and chest and shoulders to the ropes and, acting as draft animals, draw the columns up. What emerged was an exalted structure of unprecedented clarity and an uninterrupted light. For 800 years, Saint-Denis was the burial place of French kings. The National Constituent Assembly nationalized churches and religious establishments in 1789, the confiscated art to be sold. Alexander Lenoir took charge of the important storage depot of removed art. As the monarchy went, so went the abbey, its crypt full of repudiated symbols. In the summer of 1793, 51 medieval tombs were destroyed in three days. But when Marie Antoinette went on trial that autumn, the National Convention ordered that the remaining tombs be opened. Dignity, dignitaries of the new state gathered to witness the bones, corpses, and unclean ashes thrown into a ditch. Lenoir made a catalog of the object under his control and in 1795 opened the Musée de Monuments Francais. The only reason he had charged the material was that it was deemed counter-revolutionary. Lenoir had to convince the administration that preservation was not ideological. Napoleon was an enthusiast of Lenoir's collection, his displays and gardens creating a gloomy magic. Lenoir first illustrated how such a collection could convey the history of art. Francis Haskell said, in history and its images, art and the interpretation of the past. The paradox is that the destruction reaction to it gave to the arts a historical and ideological dimension that before the French Revolution had been taken for granted, Haskell continued. Louis XVIII dispersed much of Lenoir's museum, restoring what he could of the tombs at Saint-Denis bringing back what was left of bone, matted hair, embalmed heart. The Abbe Henri Grégoire, a supporter of Lenoir's, coined the term vandalism in 1794 in his report on the destruction to the National Convention. Grégoire had been a member of the Société des Amis des Noirs, and in 1808, he published the first survey of writing by people of African descent. He rushed to have his book translated into English because with the Napoleonic state in turmoil, he expected the French edition to be suppressed at any moment. An inquiry concerning the intellectual and moral faculties and literature of Negroes followed with an account of the life and works of 15 Negroes and mulattoes distinguished in science, literature, and the arts was printed in Brooklyn in 1810. Napoleon reinstituted slavery in the Caribbean for commercial reasons, but France isn't about to remove him from the Invalides. France had this conversation in the 19th century. The name of this mass murderer across battlefields is a part of French identity, even if it is immoral to insist that looted objects are among the patrimony of France. However, white male intellectuals of a certain age and right-wing opportunists are not the only defenders of secularism in France. Some of the ferocity of the encounters in the streets and the committee rooms these days reflects the contempt of one generation for another. Monument removal from public places and the deaccession of objects from public museums are not the same thing, even if the measures are intended to address the same or similar historical and systemic wrongs. The directors of the Rice Museum and the Tropen Museum are support return of artifacts to former Dutch colonies, appeasement or alignment or alliance or atonement. The collection of the Folk Museum, Folk Museum, the Museum of Folk Art. In Leiden, for instance, was initially composed of objects confiscated as pagan by Christian clergymen in what they called the Indies, who then sold the pieces on to Dutch collectors, or many objects in the Anthropological Museum of the University of British Columbia in Vancouver came from local missionaries. By far, most objects in museums were acquired at some point by purchase or bequest. Once we begin to pull at the thread, the whole fabric begins to unravel, and that may be the point. In 2018, Macron backed a report by a French historian, Benedicte Savoy, and a Senegalese writer and professor, Felwing Starr, that called for the return of some of the 90,000 pieces of museums taken from Africa by France during colonial conquests. 26 royal artifacts are to go back to Benin soon from the Quai Branly, which holds 70,000 items classed as indigenous art. A thorough inventory and redistribution process are promised. 
Claude McKay found the treasures of Benin at the British Museum lonely and misunderstood in 1922. I think of the British Museum as a world museum, but after reading about the terrible sacking of Benin City in 1897 and Dan Hicks's The British Museums, I suspect, sadly, the bronzes in time will go back. The young artist throws the bust of Frederick V into the harbor to make Denmark face its colonial past. Wazulu Dayabanza openly steals from French museums what he regards as having been stolen from Africa in the first place. A court in Marseille sided with him, declaring that his restitution protests were his right to free speech. How we confront the past influences what we will leave behind for the future. For the Ellisonian task of building new symbols in the US, a plaque on the Jefferson Memorial in Washington DC, like a dissenting opinion seems feeble but Monticello can take all the recontextualization it can get as could Mount Vernon. The inscribed walls and sculpture of the Contrabands and Freedmen Cemetery in Alexandria, Virginia, open in 2014, are modest in scale. Benjamin Banneker has only a museum in a Maryland County Park and a small fountain in DC. Then there is John Ross, the Cherokee chief who fought off Andrew Jackson's Indian removal scheme until he couldn't. A small monument to Osceola, the leader of the Seminole, was unveiled near the Tallahassee City Hall in 2018. Harriet Tubman, as a Civil War hero, deserves a good memorial in downtown New York, not Harlem. The words of the formerly enslaved, many of whom had connections with the University of Virginia, together with 4,000 marks representing some names, are carved inside a new monument on its campus, Memorial to Enslaved Laborers by Design Team Howler Yoon. It takes the form of a gradual granite concentric circle embedded in the grass. The Greenwood Art Project is a public initiative concerned with remembering through art the Tulsa, Oklahoma riots of 1921 when armed and jealous white people rampaged through the prosperous black section of town. Maya Lin's incredible Vietnam Memorial Wall, that descending wall of the names of the dead <coughs> was too new and different for many when it opened in 1982 prompting a group to sponsor in 1984, Frederick Hart's figurative with three soldiers nearby. They are tough, armed, unhelmeted, a white man a little in front of and flanked by a black man and a man supposed to represent the Latino soldier. A black artist in San Francisco lost the job to design the monument to the poet Maya Angelou for the Central Library because her plans were not traditional enough. The abstract design by a Muslim woman artist for a memorial in a Brooklyn park was rejected recently because the neighborhood wanted something representational. The giant realistic figure of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. on the mall in Washington, DC, looks like a big statue of Mao. The new social justice movement should let itself be moved by what the past cautions when it comes to politically motivated cultural arbiters. Surveillance societies everywhere now, even in our hearts. Why do artists and scholars and cultural institutions need yet more layers of control? Little fish swim along under hunters of the deep and a black musicologist attacking a journal of music theory can claim that Beethoven is white supremacy. This is absurd and a waste of time because we know that white supremacy is immediate, armed, roaming the streets, elected to office, culturally impoverished and relieved to be so. Art forms, their production, settings, context, fates, are what experts are for, and knowledge is not a conspiracy of exclusion. In the battle for control of policy and interpretation, there is an attack on the idea of a capital, a cultural center, a core, the metropolis as repository or juncture. It is the new cultural politics of what Okwe and Wazer imagined as a global cosmopolitanism devoid of margins or centers of cultural influence. Rim Coolhouse has argued that museums built in the Middle East would relieve the pressure on European museums overrun with tourists from Asia and the Middle East. But maybe it's the powerful in the Middle East who want the trappings thereof, treasures on display. I can buy out the Louvre now. In No Name in the Street, James Baldwin's disdain for what he regarded as the hypocrisy of liberalism was not unrelated to his feeling that cultural assimilation was mind control. 400 years in the West had certainly turned me into a Westerner but 400 years in the West had also failed to bleach me. The non-white peoples of the world not only have no reason to bow down before Shakespeare or Descartes or Westminster Abbey or the cathedral at Chartres, he said, they have, once these monuments intrude on their attention, no honorable access to them. Alban rejected Western art 
for being used as a front for the racism of Western society, for its being presented as evidence of Western European superiority or other cultures. Demystification was revolution. The philosophy of his history confirmed for him. My problem is that I never believed he really believed in his own cultural nihilism, however real his social rage. The Abbe Sujet spent years and a lot of money on the translucent windows of Saint-Denis. There had never been anything like them before, not even in Constantinople. After his castration, Abelar found refuge among the Benedictines of the Abbey. And nearly a thousand years later, Saint-Denis was a largely black and Arab Parisian suburb. When I first visited some time ago, the Sunday streets along the Basilica de Saint-Denis, resting place of Ermin Truda, were crammed with tables of leather goods and fabrics and discount merchandise. When mass ended, the doors released an enormous black congregation. Black people stepped out of an architecture that flung itself to the sky, as Henry Adams said. Thank you. Oh man, that was, that was fabulous. That was smoking. I didn't want you to stop. I was just, uh, it's very hard to wave <laughs> your voice, man. It was great. Um, Jesse, uh, after that brilliant introduction, please ask the first question. Yeah, wow. thank you for that introduction. And Zadie Smith did sort of hand around Christmas presents of your book in PDF. That's true. <laughs> thank you. Well, wow, it's incredible. Um, there's so much, first of all. I think that, um, as always, one of the things that I'm so impressed by is the fearlessness, the directness with which you're able to, on the one hand, survey and, and bring together for us so many of the, I suppose so many of the tensions, so many of the conflicts that are in the air all at the same time um, that we know um, in ways small and large are sort of forming the texture of our, of our the intellectual texture, but also really sort of the lived experience of our, of our, of our time. And to simultaneously sharply pick them out and also relativize them against um, a long and deeply informed and erudite uh, history <clears throat> that's also global in scope. And to ask the hardest questions um, that can be asked of that, can, that can be asked. As I was listening to that lecture, one of the things that came to my mind was um, Benjamin's famous dictum about how every uh, document of civilization is also simultaneously a document of barbarism. And I was thinking about how there seems to be this fundamental problem, uh, which is that we cannot find anywhere And, and surely there will never be a time that we will be able to have, as it were, um, the past that we would want, that, a past that fits cleanly into our um, most enlightened sense of ourselves, um, a past that sort of fits our, um, our highest ideals and conceptions of what we would wish to have happened or what we wish it to have been. And of course, upon closer examination or under critical pressure, um, every document of the past as Benjamin would have it, every certainly every monument, every architecture, every city um, will reveal itself to have been formed through historical processes that are riven through with conflict, with violence, 
um, that never represent a kind of univocal and unified subject. Because in fact, they are always, and they always exist under a, a, a field of, of tension, of contention. They, they represent societies at a given moment which are grappling at that particular moment with their past, the needs of the present, which are political needs. They represent um, the power of the state at a particular moment, which itself is merely a, a, a tool governed at that particular moment by a kind of triumphant um, class or group that doesn't actually represent right, uh, a, a totalizing identity or a totalizing state, but merely a faction of, of that state that currently holds the reins of power or cultural power and can impose its will. I was thinking about whether or not there were occasions or examples from the recent past that I felt sort of um, went somewhat against the grain of, I think, the the argument that you're proposing. And one of the things uh, that came to my mind, especially, especially since we were thinking about um, Charleston was um, that extraordinary action by the activist Bree Newsom, I believe it was 2015, not 2016, I think it was 2015, um, when she um, uh, climbed, climbed up to take down the Confederate flag from the state house. And how I think of that action and how I think of that symbol, the flag over a state house, which represents uh, state power. Um, and it is at least ostensibly supposed to represent the polity of the state and that with and that and itself within the federal United States. That 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 action seems to me more than justified. Um, and also in, in, but perhaps in important ways different from uh, the taking down of various statues. Not that I think I have, uh, and, and you've clearly thought about it far more than I have, that I don't have a view, I think, or a take as it were to say, to adjudicate on the matter of different statues. But I suppose one of the things, you know, you. You mentioned and invoked, I think, Ellison at a moment there, that one of the things that I, I often think about is the ways in which African Americans have such a rich and long cultural history of proposing a kind of what I what I think of as a um, monuments that are that are maybe the ones that are um, they, they are less useful to certain kinds of symbolic and uh, state power and certain kinds of man manipulation in the way that public art and public statues are. Um, and yet they propose a kind of, of matrix, a positive matrix for civility, um, broadly conceived. Where I, where, but what I mean by civility is a way for us to live together as a melding of disparate cultures within which all have a significant contribution to make. And I'm thinking of course of uh, uh, you know, Ellison's favored metaphor here, which would be jazz as a great American monument in a sense. It's not a statue, but it is in many ways a, a living monument. Um, and a living and great tradition that speaks to and offers a way for us to conceive of a shared creative matrix for being together, um, celebrating together, enjoying each other's company. Um, but that also in a sense speaks to a kind of project that we want to undertake together um, in a way that the, the monuments as you said provocatively, even the monument uh, to Dr. King uh, perhaps fail to do in quite the same way. And since we have Professor Gates here, and I'm, 
I myself too am still grappling and thinking about the power of um, his documentary on the Black Church, I would say I also think about the contributions that the Black Church has made in this regard. Um, and I was thinking even recently, especially because we're in the midst of this pandemic about the extraordinary, you know, uh, story um, of the yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia in 1793, you know, when Richard Allen and, um, and Absalom Jones, you know, took it upon themselves as the gentry, the white gentry sort of fled the city to try and save themselves from this terrible pandemic. And uh, these black clergymen took it upon themselves as an act of civic duty to stay behind and to rally support for tending to the sick, for, um, you know, uh, for consolation. And they did it with a kind of expressly Republican philosophy in the sense that this, they, this was an occasion as they understood it to demonstrate to the city and in a larger sense to the country, um, the importance of the black community, its contribution and its um, commitment to building, you know, a, a, a polis, a city, a culture, a civilization together. And of course, tragically, but tellingly, and this speaks to many of the examples that you invoked, I think often about the Charleston massacre and shootings and, and you invoked it the many times that we've seen um, terrible violence and, and racist counter reaction. Um, uh, uh, notable white publisher, I think it was uh, Carey, John Carey, I think, um, actually attacked them for undertaking this project, alleged and claimed that they were doing it um, uh, um, as, as a kind of fraudulent way to, to make money, to kind of a kind of scheme, which was of course entirely baseless and they were largely able to, to counteract that slander. But it seemed to me that there you had the, even in that example, you have these, these two cases where on the one hand you have a kind of tradition of black humanism attempting to forge cultural modes of understanding and expression and association that will enable us to live together and reactionary and racist forces that are always trying to undermine that project. And it may be that, and it's always struck me that one hope that I have is that, and I wonder if this is, if you would agree that this is sort of the, the line that I, I hear you taking that erasure as much as it may seem satisfying in the short run is never nearly as powerful or successful a symbol or action as uh, making a counter offer, mm. um, making our own better monuments instead, yes. rallying people to a <clears throat> counter vision that we fill with creative energy and positive contribution rather than attempting to erase and take down things which in the end, um, though perhaps in various cases, they, they could be justified, ultimately only feed into a kind of logic and a cycle in which ultimately everyone loses. Mm -hmm. And ultimately there's a kind of um, impasse and uh, a, a, an inability to live with our history, our collective history, our human collective history um, that, that can only prevent a, the ultimate outcome that we have to aspire for since at some point, at some level, um, and this has always been one of my contentions about the magnificence in a sense of African-American culture is this understanding that, you know, for all the wishes of the white supremacists, it's too late, you know? Say We're that here. again. The black church is going nowhere. Oh. Uh, it's too late for the yeah. white supremacists. Yes. You know? The, the, the black church is going nowhere. Black culture is not uh, some immigrant outsider force that they can somehow delegitimize. 
Um, its contributions are magnificent and beloved and rightly so, and more attractive than the visions that they have on offer. Um, as you said, I, I thought it was a really, it's a brief uh, thing in mass, but you, you mentioned how so many of those right-wing forces are, if I, if I had it uh, correctly, it was beautifully said, uh, sort of relieved to be unburdened of culture. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, it's, it's, I think, rather impressive and interesting how so much of that reactionary fervor is, um, has such a deep antipathy to cultivation. Um, and, and I, one of the things that I, I try to believe in, that I try to hope for, um, and that I try to use as a gauge of, of, for my own thinking is that you're probably on the right side if that's a side that artists and creative people are inspired by and interested in, in, in being a part of, right? And, and, if, and, and if that's not the case, then you should be concerned. Um, if, if, if artists and creative people and free thinkers are starting to flee from the proposals that you're putting forward, that should certainly be a warning sign to you. I wonder, I know that's a long response, but you've given so much um, as always for us to, to consider and to think oh, about, but well. um, that's, that's <laughs> you, some of just You've given me a lot to think, think about really there. Hard. I mean, uh, um, I remember when she took the flag down, uh, the Confederate flag, and um, I also remember my embarrassment or shame because I have to say that the family from the South seeing the Confederate flag on license plates, it never crossed my mind that it would ever go away. Uh, a lot of the things mm. we're talking about were here when I was born and I just kind of, you know, never thought about it otherwise. Mm. It's partly my uh, separation from the public, uh, my lack of interest in the public, um, because uh, I still carry around a rather old-fashioned division between um, culture and politics. Um, and for me, uh, culture, artistic production is first is a human drama, but it is, it's, it's at some point an individual, or I mean, it's, uh, it's an individual drama, even if it moves to collaboration and you know, a lot of people involved in the process of production. Um, it seems to me contrary so a lot of things people are demonstrating against. Uh, the reason I never sort of believe Baldwin said what he said is that I don't think that these people represent, I mean, they didn't think of themselves in that kind of, in, in the same terms he's casting them any more than Africans did at that time. As Africans, you know, we all know that's an invention of a, a sort of later. And so actually these particular productions say things that we we're on the side of, uh, and they're not on the side of the people who want to do us down. Culture, I've always thought of as our ally and support, um, and that all of it nurtures us if it's in the right direction. Um, then again, uh, because Black American history being what it was, we cannot overcome our utilitarian view of art. Um, 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 and that's also a problem. But then, you know, social change is never even. Uh, and then uh, the arts Black people could uh, uh, develop, uh, uh, sort of reflect that. Uh, so yes, we've had sculptors and artists. Uh, where I live used to be um, the Harlem Arts Center. And Augusta Savage was the principal. I think I'm sitting in her office now. And I always didn't think how she couldn't save her large work because she couldn't afford to store the models and things like that. One of the things we don't think about is how fragile the survival of objects are anyway uh, uh, in time. Uh, um, um, and which is why the ones that do survive seem to us rather precious in a way or should. Uh, I remember once looking at a 5,000 year old uh, carpet uh, in St. Petersburg it was amazing. Uh, so um, I also sort of commit the sin of you know, artifacts for me sort of lose, um, uh, I don't know, some of their surroundings and become something else more personal. I, I can't describe it. Uh, um, the problem, say, with King is no memorial you could put up can rival his voice 
uh, in our heads. Mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing mm -hmm. you can put up for King as beautiful as his own voice. It's just not possible. And I think this is true for many parts of uh, many people we want to celebrate in Black America. There's a very well meant statue to Duke Ellington at the north of uh, Central Park and uh, apologies to who made it, who paid for it, who wanted it up, but I think it's kind of awful uh, uh, and not, it doesn't to me represent, you know, the sort of grace of composition of Duke Ellington. But again, all these things are subjective. Other people may sort of find it wonderful and think I'm, I'm full of it. Uh, so it's hard to suggest, I think it's, I think it's, I think doctrines of any kind are dangerous, even well-meant ones. But I think you make the most important point, which is, you know, ask the artists, uh, um, follow them. It, it, um, I, I had to, uh, Jesse, do you want to respond to Daryl? I didn't mean to cut you off. Please, I'm just babbling, so. No, go no, ahead. go ahead. No, I had to crack up because, you know, my wife, Mary Al Iglesias, the <laughs> historian is Cuban citizen. <laughs> and the first time, we went to Martin Luther King's statue. She said, that looks just like Mao Zedong. You, you see know, what I mean? Called. So I'm not and the I only said, one. I said, shush, shush, we were at all these black people. Actually, we were filming uh, for a PBS documentary and there were people watching us. Mary Ellen said, look at that. It looked like Mao. And I go, Mary Ellen, stop. So I'm really like, <laughs> well, I'm glad, she, I'm glad you told me that. I and then so weird. W when I looked at it, I was too pr uh, prideful, as we say, to admit to her that she was right, you know, a couple, you know, and I went like, he does not. And I looked at it and said, oh my God, he looked just like, he looks like, it looks like a Mal statue dominating, you know, Red Square or something. But I, 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 I know it was uh, his fraternity that, um, his college fraternity, I believe, if memory serves, that commissioned that statue. And I remember wondering if they thought that that was a sign of universality. You know, I mean, you understand uh, the history mm -hmm. of our people aesthetically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. better than I do. And, no, and, no, and Jesse, no. So, no, but, you know, having a non-Black person do it at one point in our history was a sign of our place in nature, you know, mm -hmm. our uh, arrival. Yes, yes. And I wondered, I always wondered if that was, if it was, had the contest been blind, what they, if, if what they would have chosen, or if that was a subtext, or maybe they just liked it. But I am never, you know, as much as I love um, uh, James Baldwin, even when I was a teenager, and it was the summer of 65 when I read that line about Chart, the not being able to identify, you know. Now, I, I didn't know that I would ever go to Europe. I mean, I was determined I'd go to Europe, but I thought it would be when I was a medical doctor or something, right? I didn't know in four years I'd be in Europe, you know, looking at Notre Dame or at the Louvre or whatever. And I never felt any alienation from uh, anything of beauty in the whole wide world. I mean, um, now maybe someone could say, okay, but what don't you find beautiful? And maybe that's culturally biased. I, I just think that um, when I climbed the Parthenon uh, when I was 19, that was one of the most moving days of my life. But so we're seeing an Ifa divination ceremony or, you know, in uh, Abiyokuta in near Wally Shayinka's home, or I could give you a list of things. I, I was raised, at least in my mind, <laughs> to aspire to be a citizen of the world, as corny as that sounds, no. you know, you know, that all I wanted to bathe in all the world's the beautiful and the true, you know, Du Bois. Yeah. You always tell me, you mentioned the other day that I was, um, I was wrestling with Du Bois in the book about the black church. 
And I thought, oh my God, I guess I am. But it's not resonant to me. I'm just trying to wrap my arms around them, you know, or trying to flesh out um, the sermon, the music, the frenzy. Yeah, that's the structure of the series. And those are the themes and the structure um, of the book. But I got up when Jesse was asking this question and went into my living room to get a copy of um, my, my book and because I wanted to read you this. I was just reading it like two hours ago. By the way, Bobo said he loves the fact that you claim that you're cousins because you really are. <laughs> and he wrote me back and said, my mother loved Capital L, Daryl's mother. So My mother him, loved Jackie Bobo. I mean, it, really did. No, it's what he said. They had another friend, the two others, Salonia Blatch and Mary Parks Washington. They were all... Wow. I remember the name because they're yeah. My mother really cared about the, your uh, Larry's mom and, well, you gotta, and his grandma. You got to call him later. Wish him happy birthday. I'll, I'll be will. over there at six thirty. Listen okay. to this. this Send me his out. phone number on. Uh, I will. Okay, sorry. Read. You okay? No, I will. I'll, I'll um, send Thank it to you. Thank you. This is from Murray, and it, it you could I could make I could give you page after page of similar quotes, even going from the um, 19th century, certainly, to uh, Mary Baraka. Um, the great novelist and critic Albert Murray refuted any notion that the spirituals were lacking or primitive in any way. Quote, you can put the spirituals right in there against the stained windows of the great cathedrals, uh, square bracket, of Europe, square bracket, without a drop in aesthetic sophistication or profundity. I'm proud of that. I want us to stake our claim to that. So um, I don't know where my question is, except that you, I don't, you don't have to look like the subject to appreciate the subject. You don't have to look like the subject to study the su subject. You don't have to look like the subject to find beauty and truth in the, the subject. And um, it's a funny thing, like, well, we don't have, stained glass window cathedrals, but we got the spiritual, you know, it's, it's a funny way to think of it, but I understand what he means. Yes. You know, one time, one time I traded Bob O'Mealy and you know, Robert O'Mealy. Oh yeah. I wanted a copy of a Ray Charles album and that I had lost and he's got 18 million albums. This was 30 years ago. And I said, I'll give you a first edition of the bluest eye for this Ray Charles. No, it was a, it was a multi, yes, it was the Ray Charles, the man in his music or something. It was gold and it had like five albums. on. It was one of those things. And I really loved that. And I lost it. And I said, I'll trade you the bluest eye and the dust jacket for a man in his music or whatever. He, he thought about it. He said, okay, deal. You know, at first, he said, am I being tricked? This is Signify Monkey, you know? <laughs> and then he said to me, wow, I wonder if you could write an essay about, uh, you know, comparative, the weight of aesthetic values, you know, this sort of apples and oranges thing. Um, anyway, this wasn't a question so much as a statement that beauty's beauty to me, and I don't care if it's in whatever country, every and culture, just like I want, I don't teach African-American and African studies just for black people. You know, one of the things that, one of the reasons that I'm trying to reach out and use as many different forms of new media and old media as I can, and I've done that since, you know, when I graduated from Yale, I wrote for Time Magazine in the summer, is to reach people. <laughs> you know, I want to tell the story. Yeah. You know, that old, I love to tell the story of Jesus and his own or something. You know, I love to tell the story. Yeah. I want it to be in pre-K. I don't want it to be Black History Month. I want it to be inextricably interwoven in the narrative. You know, I just, and I like it each time I do one, I go, okay, now what do I do again? You know, yeah. <laughs> so I just would like your response to Jesse's and anybody else's to that. Does that make me old fat? So many of us pull, but you're not black, so you can't. And I hate that. You know, yeah, I think it's too. disgusting. Me too. Or because you're black, you shouldn't. I mean, uh, yeah, it's the uh, flip side of the same thing. And if somebody said, because you're not British, you can't 
teach Shakespeare, you'd say you're a racist, you know, and everybody would try to get you fired. Well, so, <laughs> they said that to um, Scarborough when he tried to teach Greek at uh, Wilberforce, so forget it. Um, I mean, my family always said, you know, uh, they wouldn't have put it this way, but the attitude was, you know, culture is available to everyone and don't worry about it. All these white people have no idea what this stuff is. So it's not white culture, you know, it's whatever. Uh, and I was thinking the other day about something that was really big deal for Ellison, and that's the music in the schools move movement of the 1920s uh, and the black students learning, uh, being exposed to different uh, musical traditions and things like that. And it's a pity we've lost that national program because it certainly did bring cultures to students uh, in this very immediate way, as well as live music, which they don't have anymore uh, sort of growing up. Uh, yeah, and, you know, my attitude was, uh, and you know this, in the culture wars uh, at their yes. uh, rawest, I never wanted to get rid of the canon. No. I just wanted to integrate, yeah. you know? I yeah. never wanted to- Loose cannons, I love that book, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but I never wanted to throw out the dead white males. I just wanted to move oh. over a little bit, get some dead white women and dead and live black women and live white black men, you know? Um, besides, what, what, what black author was not influenced by, what great black author, what any black author was not influenced by white authors? I mean, that's ridiculous. Yeah, but I mean, it's just the way it is, you know? I'm afraid, you know, we can say everything we want to about Hemingway, but he did in that time change the American sentence for so many people. And he did. Can, and, and then and, it's Faulkner. And, yeah. And Look, then Faulkner's it's Salander. children. Look, Faulkner's children. Uh, Ralph Tony Ellison, Morrison, your friend Tony Morrison, and uh, Marquez, you know, like, and two of the three got Nobel Prizes, and if Ralph Ellison had written the second book, he'd have gotten a Nobel Prize, you know. <laughs> <laughs> if you mean Faulkner. if he had finished his second book. If he had finished his second book, yeah. This is a burning thing for me, that this thing that he, I wish they'd published a whole thing like Muzil's Man Without Qualities, just the whole thing. Yeah. And just see what, you know, just with notes and everything, rather than try to make a book. Well, anyway, that's another thing. Well, I don't even think people read The Man Without Qualities anymore, but that was, but we had to read that in, in the 90s. Anyway, we're gonna get, it's like yeah, you and sorry. I you know, haven't did it, <laughs> hogging the whole thing. Krishna, <laughs> Abby, open it up. Tell me, unplug my mic. <laughs> no. um, I love you, it's brilliant, it's just brilliant. Uh, and I must say that uh, I, I didn't do the black church justice. I. When I finished last night, I didn't write right away because I just had to sit there. Uh, uh, it was really overwhelming. I hadn't expected to feel, even after the end of part one, I hadn't quite expected to feel what I did at the end of part two. Uh, it's partly not having grown up really in the black church myself, apart from the NAACP really, but uh, it did really shake up something in me that I haven't been able to think about before and then you know, the one thing you do as a narrator and host is that you make all feeling okay. Mm. You know, that it's a very sort of welcoming uh, experience. And uh, it's very odd to find someone who is a mixture of uh, J.A. Rogers and Derrida and Bakhtin. It's really... <laughs> I want that recorded, <laughs> written down at my funeral on my... Uh, you have a very great my... reach of audience, <laughs> you, know, you can talk to anybody. I've seen that. So you do it on camera too. You can talk to anyone. Uh, thank you, man. That's the best review I could have got. But be no, no, no. And then the visuals and the music and a lot of things I didn't know. I'd never heard of Prathia Hall before. Mm. Uh, you know, and it's also one of those films that doesn't make you ashamed for what you didn't know or hadn't thought important. So well, you it's know, very humble making to watch it as well. Well, since we're going to extend this, uh, Abby, you can forget stopping at five thirty because it's oh, only sorry. with Jesse. No, we have to finish. So. No, no, no. You got to, you got to answer just a few questions. But one of the reasons I make films is to learn. It's like taking a graduate class, and that's why I put so many people on camera. You know, I'm really asking them, help me to understand this, and then we. You, you, if you see an interview with. with um, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, I might have sat with her, or Cornell West, I might have sat with them for an hour or oh, yeah. an hour and a half. Yeah. And then you use 
two minutes. Yeah, yeah. But I have all of that text and you see it in the books that follow. My books follow from the films rather than the other way around. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Um, go ahead. Uh, would you it's take a marvelous a film? It really Thank is. you. Thank you. Would you take I love few... Latin America, but this one really. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Would you mind taking a few more questions beyond 530? Not really. You can see from her face, she doesn't want to. No, I, I, want to, I have a bunch of questions here from our audience. So I would love to do that. So great. Um, I was just trying to interpret Thank what you. not really means when you, what question you were answering. But um, I think, so I'm going to combine a couple of questions just in the interest of time. And because I think they are um, related. But the first question I want to start with addresses your own work, um, your own creative work. Um, it's from an anonymous attendee who says, your essay is lyrical and reminiscent of such responses or critiques to colonialism and empire as Walcott's poetry. Have you, have you consciously chosen creative form to encompass or address difficult histories? Hmm. Uh, it's difficult to say. Um, in the sense that uh, I think of the essay as imaginative prose, then yes, I'm not really a scholar. Uh, I, you know, I can only know something by reading about it or going to find out. So. You know, the, it's the reaction that I'm trying to um, capture or figure out uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what other texts am I speaking to or thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, um, but yes, you know, you, you try in fiction and nonfiction to uh, deal with certain themes mm -hmm. um, in a creative way. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's a feeble answer, but no, not maybe, at all. Maybe it will pass. It leads to two of the other okay. questions, which I'm going to combine okay. a little bit. Um, and one comes from another one of your cousins, apparently David Wilkins. Ah. <laughs> Daryl, I can't be more proud and not just because you are my cousin. It all, so I am gonna, I'm going to couple his question with another one. I owe um, him an email about a, a, do, a, a program he made with his brother that was oh, really- well. You can anyway okay that could be a whole other conversation yeah, yeah. um if all monuments are both victor's history and living sites of resistance and redefinition is the point that we should spend our time on insisting on facing history and embracing redefinition rather than trying to erase it and i'm going to combine that with a question that comes from kim benston um a literary scholar who just delivered a gorgeous um, colloquium for us yesterday. Um, he calls this an extraordinary exploration. And he says, if every monument is conceived in blindness as well as insight, might we do best by relieving our public landscapes of all monumental expression? Or is that a risk we much, must take in order to express present historical consciousness against the background of our landscape's hard impositions? So another two questions about that facing history or what are we embracing or facing now? Yes, I think that we have to uh, confront the past and be aware of the past and not forget the past. I think we live in a moment that isn't aware enough of the past, no matter what side you're on. Um, culture at the moment is so sprawling and broad and fractured and there's so much going on now that you know the past uh, seems rather small, oddly enough, and it should be the other way around. Um, I would sort of concentrate more on building what's new, mm. uh, making what's new. Um, monuments as art is a very sort of um, complicated uh, subject, and a lot of the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, people who are uh, remembered that way, these things come up many years or centuries uh, um, uh, after the events or the lives. I mean, how do they know what the young Christopher Columbus looked like? They don't, mm -hmm. you know, it's just a kind of 
I idea or something like that. Uh, um, and uh, but you know it's always going to reflect uh, some interest, uh, and often it's who shows up. Mm. You know, if there's a sort of uh, a public meeting, uh, it's who shows up, mm -hmm. um, or you know uh, who has influence, who's on the committee, and so forth. So all that is um, unpredictable. But if I had to say anything, I would say you know, uh, we, uh, confronting the past and building for the future are not the same thing. Mm. The one may inform the other, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that um, uh, there'll always be monuments because there's something ritualistic in them, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and um, um, because people want to say something about where they live. Um, mm. um, you know, we're passing by things that were there long before we were, and that may still be there after we've gone. Um, I didn't talk about the Reformation and the trauma uh, of, for a lot of people in England watching um, um, artifacts uh, uh, um, violently sort of ripped out of their churches in, in that way. Um, um, so I think people have an attachment to sort of things, mm -hmm. uh, to making things, mm -hmm. uh, and um, to veneration, mm -hmm. you know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's always going to be a part of what any social gathering people do mm -hmm. remember, mm -hmm. because you know we tell stories, mm -hmm. and and art is always a, a story, mm -hmm. one way or the other, mm -hmm. uh, and these are the stories that kind of stay, we hope, or live with us. Right. Right. Yeah, the stories that we choose. The monuments are the stories we choose to tell always. Right. Um, there's another question connected from Abby Schreiber, who says, thank you for your remarks today. I wonder if you could speak more to the critique of artistic censorship that seems to be part of what you're unearthing here. All representation may be violent, as Professor McCarthy implied in his remarks, but it seems to me that the examples you're giving have caused so much pain because censorship and removal itself, particularly as aimed at black artistic and cultural voice was already an inherent part of dominant white supremacist culture. So there's not, that's more, I guess, a comment that she's looking for a response to um, than a question per se. Hmm, I'm not sure I understand. Okay. Um, Let's see, sometime. In uh, I would say that black culture has suffered more from suppression uh, than censorship, you mm -hmm. know, sort of keeping it from being. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it was in other ways, you know, you smash it down this way, it will come out that way. Uh, and we have a great attachment to black culture as the expression of the margins mm -hmm. uh, and the vernacular. Uh, and it is something of a trauma when it becomes mainstream because, of course, the meaning changes mm. uh, in that kind of shift. Um, uh, so uh, I think that it's rather dangerous to keep this uh, Soviet model in our heads that oppression is somehow good for art. Mm. Um, that's not true. It's destructive mm. uh, and ought not to be romanticized as a condition. Mm -hmm. um, or uh, anything like that. It is remarkable that uh, people did anything uh, uh, under uh, different kinds of circumstances. So, you know, uh, the will to create is also the will to live. Mm. Uh, and that's one of the things that can't be sort of stomped out. Uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, the wish to express yourself is, uh, you know, uh, an announcement of one's humanity, mm -hmm. and that also can't sort of can't be stomped out. So mm -hmm. I think that um, uh, black artists and black people have made or found uh, opportunities and chances where they could, and um, you know, uh, um, we have to remember that. I mean, James Whitton said that 
we're as far from modernism now as modernism was from romanticism. But certain kind of uh, uh, ideas about art, I think, are still with us, uh, which is that um, uh, conventional society uh, is rather distrustful uh, of art. Uh, um, uh, and, and we still assume that the artist has a slightly uh, priest-like function of uh, critique or uh, dissent or um, revelation uh, to the general society. Uh, and um, yeah, um, I don't know if I've answered that young lady's question at all, but uh, um, I think, I'll just well, sort of go dot, dot, dot. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, what you yeah. know. It was really I cannot get my thoughts together at all. Now. No, no, yeah. that's okay. No, 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 um, I'm telling her I'm sorry I can't do better by as an answer. <laughs> She's still in the audience, so maybe she'll have a follow up. But uh, yes, here's a question that just came in that, and I think we have just two more questions, and then we'll um, okay wrap up, or you know, if Skip or Jesse wants to finish up. Um, this is something I was thinking about because I recently I heard. Your, look at the books and find people. Who <laughs> It's always tempting. Um, this is, I was thinking about this because I just recently heard a story about, I think the San Francisco um, Board of Education or some body in San Francisco has submitted the names of something like 40 or 60 schools to rename. And um, among those schools are schools named for Abraham Lincoln. Um, Diane Feinstein. Yes, exactly. But I think the Lincoln one is the one that's been pulled out as, uh, you know, your, your sac. It's part of that larger history. And I think it addresses that question that you mentioned, like when you, once you pull one thread, the whole fabric starts to go. And I think we hear a lot like, well, what are you going to do? Change everything named Washington or everything named Jefferson? But the question that came in is about more artfully put than I just did. Um, do you have any insights on the renaming of public institutions such as high schools or other buildings? Is it important to acknowledge where we want to be going as a community and facing what might have been done unconsciously in the past? Um, and um, the person mentions the Dixie Public School was renamed in my city recently, for example, for this reason. It was called the Dixie Public. It, school. I guess there was a. I don't know where there was a Dixie Public School that was recently. Well, renamed. I don't think the Dixie Chicks should have changed the band's name to Chicks. Right. That's you right. know Dixie Chicks, and plus since they were kind of not Dixie, mm -hmm. you know it sort of it took over the word Dixie uh, mm -hmm. uh, anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're punishing Lincoln for his uh, uh, times when he wasn't uh, in favor of. Uh, uh, the freed people um, mm -hmm. remaining in America, but thought, you know, colonization was the answer. Uh, actually, Lincoln is the great person to name things for because he had a sort of change of heart and, and, and actually brought the union with him uh, because his reluctance or his ambivalence was there and then he was clear in the end. Mm -hmm. So no, I don't think Lincoln's Hmm. Names should be changed, and um, you know, when it mattered, Lincoln uh, was the right guy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I'm no, I, I'm against that. Mm -hmm. And also, I find a lot of these things. Um, uh, what are they compared to the actual threats we're facing at mm -hmm. the moment? Mm -hmm. Some things make us feel we're doing something. And it's a kind of, um, you know, it, it's a gesture, all right. But, uh, you know, given the serious uh, uh, things facing the nation, um, mm -hmm. the, they, they aren't sort of high on my list as right. things that could uh, help us. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, I'm not in favor of uh, mm -hmm. changing sort of the names of Lincoln, things like that. Mm -hmm. My new things get changed all the time. Mm -hmm. And I still call it the state theater because I'm not going to call it the Coke theater mm. uh, and so on and so right. forth. And, you know, right. And that's a choice, uh, I guess we yeah, can yeah. use to, you know. Yeah. Um, and I've got nothing against the Astors. Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> I think um, the link in the, and my history is not, I'm not clear on the history, but I seem to recall that the Lincoln issue is not about 
um, that, you know, some of his beliefs about blacks or some of his, what he professed, but about an earlier, earlier statements or policies that he enacted towards Native Americans. So uh, I think there you're brave. I mean, I think this is- I see. Actually, Oops, I, I betrayed think, something there. Right, exactly. You know, I, I think, wasn't thinking of them. <laughs> I was thinking of me. But that's exactly part of this conversation, Oops. I think, is how we're, you know, there are different histories and intersecting histories at play. And that's where that threat, pulling that thread- Well, starts. I still wouldn't change yeah. sort of Lincoln names, but, you know, uh, why not sort of name new things after Seminole or Cherokee? Uh, and, you know, the America is full of Indian names mm -hmm. or sorry, Native American names, mm -hmm. you know, but just as sort of places or things like that are sort of, you know, lingering, it's there. But yes, you just make a concerted effort to call it that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're regarding everyone as war criminals, uh, uh, you know, it's hard to find a public figure in US history who doesn't have something to answer for, mm -hmm. given mm -hmm. our history. This is the whole, whole point. I wouldn't rush out and name anything Custer, but you know. Uh, right. But no, not, not Lincoln or mm -hmm. anything. Okay. I think that's your answer is a perfect segue to I think what is a really good last question. Okay. Um, that comes from one of our fellows, Martha Patterson, and it's about layering. So precisely what you were just talking about. She says, she asks first, are there any American monuments you would see as important to remove? But more to the point, I think, what might it mean to leave graffiti on some monuments, defining them through layers of response? Um, or changing the way one approaches the moment to define the reaction. How do we encourage Americans to reimagine past landscapes, people, places, people destroyed? Again, back through this kind of layering of response. Hmm. Uh, that's a difficult one to say. You know, if they left uh, on Churchill's statue in Parliament Square was a racist, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, I could see that. Isn't that a terrible thing to say? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, my youth in New York was in, the, in, in this graffiti time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there is one building on the Bowery, I think it used to be Mark Lancaster's studio that's still covered in graffiti. Mm -hmm. uh, and it really stands out you know, uh, and not in the sense of being preserved or anything, but uh, as a mm, something that doesn't look mm. very good. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something that when everything on the Bowery was a mess, it was just there. But now that, you know, the Bowery is kind of something else, mm -hmm. this sort of stands out, but not, not in a particularly nice way. Mm -hmm. So yes, it depends on how, artistic the layering is and uh, you know graffiti that's just tags to me I don't find so interesting if they're painting something else you know like the street murals they used to have in Harlem mm -hmm. that they have less of now that's different so even that depends on uh, uh, the quality of what's being done what's being added to I mean my problem with a lot of public art is that I don't find it very interesting right uh, and my problem with my attitude toward public art is I don't expect it to be. Mm. Um, uh, uh, I don't think of uh, religious artifacts or religious art in still in churches in the same way that I think of, you know, uh, uh, political and sort of social or monuments. I mean, the Tiergarten has these symbols of the German past, but it's full of monuments to artists and myths and, uh, you know, Greek uh, characters and things like that. You know, if you trip over Mendelssohn Bartleby into the tear garden as easily mm -hmm. as a nymph and things like that. So mm -hmm. um, when you go around, or if you can go around and from Egyptian museum to Egyptian museum and city after city after city, it's crammed with stuff. And sometimes I think, what must Egypt have looked like? you know, of sort of filled with stuff, you know, that had accumulated for a long time because for all of this stuff from Egypt to be in so many collections everywhere, 
that place was, you know, sort of stuffed to the gills with, with objects, and that had to have been layering. Uh, 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 and and we do it anyway. It's just uh, anyway. Once again, I'm rambling away, but uh, it's a good question that I failed to answer well. Oh, I don't. We can listen to you ramble for. Oh, if this is your rambling, that's. <laughs> that's a, Ask that's... my partner how long you can actually listen to me ramble. <laughs> That's one thing about the pandemic, you know, yeah. you is... sort of halfway through dinner and notice you haven't said a word yet, you know? It's... <laughs> so, well, I think on that note, we will. Um, we, anyway, we will... I, thank you guys very much for having me. We, and, we will uh, unmute It's been an and, honor and. Uh, yeah. Unmute and uh, applaud, man, you are <laughs> fabulous. The only thing I'm sorry. You are my hero, Professor Gates. No, I you love are you. my Mom. hero. You're my brother, man. Um, um, you know, get busy, write another essay that I can read so I can learn something more. Ha, I'd, ha, like ha. To, I'd like to thank uh, young Jesse. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. McCarthy. That I was, I was very moved, so thank you. Yeah, it was beautiful, a beautiful yeah, really. introduction. Yeah. Yeah. That's the future, and man. He is, and congratulations right. on your book. I mean, it's really, well, you'll be hearing more about that. <laughs> Carol, it was brilliant. Thank you. No. So I'm just sorry that we're not in person. We can't can hang out, and that it's not the first of two more. Um, but when we uh, survive COVID and get back to normal, you'll be back. Thank you. God thank bless you. you, and thank you guys for having me. And thank you, Bravo. Jesse, very much. I appreciate it. Bravo. Very kind. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.